Good morning to everyone. It's really great to see you. Yeah, I'm so excited and fired up to be here with you. Um, Arlene Noe. I'm the Secretary of United Teachers Los Angeles, a uh, parent speech therapist who was elected to be an officer, and I've been co-chair of our bargaining team since 2017. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ashley Michelle Flores, pronouns uh, she or they. Um, I am a community organizer at LANE, that stands for Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. We're a nonprofit advocacy organization that partners with labor unions all around town. Um, I'm on the education campaign, so we serve as an anchor organization for Reclaim Our Schools Los Angeles. Uh, along with UTLA and two other organizations called uh, ACE, Alliance for Californians for Community Empowerment, and Students Deserve, which is a black and brown grassroots student-led movement to invest in black students and uh, restorative justice and things like that. Hi, my name is Allie Lewis. I am an LAUSD parent and a parent organizer with Reclaim Our Schools. I'm also uh, a co-founder of the parent advocacy group Angelinos for Green Schools. Thank you so much and welcome all. Um, I think that last night, for those of us who stuck around and watched the video movie short film, it was incredibly powerful and wonderful to see all the energy um, in the strike. So. Um, Arlene, if you could just describe the strike and the moments coming out of it. Well, I don't think I have to say too much because you saw the movie. Um, you got a real feel for um, th the strike that we held in 2019. And I think what was really important is we changed the narrative around public education. And, and it, we won because of parents, students, and community. So I think that was really good for all of our uh, educators to see is how powerful it is when we are united in solidarity. And the experience of solidarity was powerful. So these are just some um, really quick slides since you saw the movie, but we had picketing in the morning uh, at the school site. So these just show you some of those places I visited in the morning before I went into negotiations. And then in the afternoon, you know, we had the whole big rallies. Uh, this was a parent's home across from the school at one of the schools I visited, and you could see the support from the parents. They had the food stations there, and inside they had all the, um, the next slide, please. You could see the, the kids watching TV or, uh, and all the water and the supplies, and the, she had a big pot of soup. Uh, so it was just a really wonderful um, connecting relation, uh, relationship building uh, opportunity. So yeah, you could just keep going. This just shows some of the faces. And this just tells you what we won in the strike and how comprehensive it was. Uh, and that was really exciting that we were able to win real demands. And here's some of our Reclaim Our Schools parents. They had their own little strike school during the strike. And they went, uh, had press conferences, went to school board members, and put the pressure on um, and, and now many of these parents are le now leaders of Reclaim Our Schools LA, and uh, we keep growing and building, right? So I think that's, okay, that's it for right now. Yeah. Ashley, do you think you could talk about how Reclaim and Lane uh, support in the strike and how they came into play? Yeah, definitely. So Reclaim Our Schools LA, as I mentioned, is a coalition of a bunch of different organizations from different stakeholder groups, which I think really is our strength um, and is very unique also. Uh, you know, Reclaim Our Schools LA brings in parents of, you know, students that go to school, students themselves, um, teachers and, you know, education staff, of course. But then people like me, community members that live within uh, LA Unified's like boundaries but don't have kids that uh, go to LA USD schools or don't have kids in general. I don't have kids in general. Um, uh, or, you know, I'm not a teacher. So we really bring in everybody uh, to really fight for investment in our public schools and, and racial justice. Um, and yeah, uh, Arlene kind of spoke to that in like the way that, you know, we organize delegations with uh, decision makers 
um, and you know really bring our people uh, to those spaces. Thank you. I just to briefly editorialize, and I think s some folks, when you see the video, right, it was raining, um, and for folks who are not local to Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, we don't get much rain. And our infrastructure is not built for rain. Most of us don't have clothes for rain. Uh, so it was an incredibly big deal for all of that movement to happen through rain. Um, it was incredible. Um, and so Arlene, if you could talk about also like what was happening at the time um, and building into the strike. Yes. Um, I would have to go back to 2014 uh, is when we as a, a, a number of us came together. We're, you know, we're activists, we're organizers, we're progressives, and we transformed our union in 2014. What we had to do is basically organize to win, uh, but we put together a diverse team of seven of us, because we have seven officers in UTLA representing geographically diversity, you know, ethnic and, and so forth. And, and we, went, we came together around a single agenda, and that's the schools LA students deserve. And it's similar to Chicago, right? The schools Chicago teachers deserve. That is, I think, what's going on across the nation with education unions. We've got to center on our students, and their learning conditions is our working conditions. So we put the two together, and so we got elected, here's lesson one, with a rank and file movement and a progressive vision and, and mandate. And that's what we were able to do is uh, really push through uh, this kind of uh, focus. W UTLA has been, um, I'd say, we had strong strengths, but we also had weaknesses through the years. And we were kind of like ebbed and flow according to who was the leader. Uh, but it wasn't a team. We brought in a team all focused on the same goal and aligning our whole infrastructure and our departments in UTLA, creating new ones to go with our focus of students deserve. So in other words, we never had a parent community department. We never had a research department in our union. Those were critical. We didn't even have the correct contact information of folks, right? That's the basics of organizing. So we've got a full database now that you can access anybody on the phone. You know every vote they've had, every activity they've been engaged in. We know who to contact according to clusters of schools. So uh, we'll go lesson two is we immediately began transformation to achieve our vision. Again, we began making staff changes, creating uh, departments, and relentless dialogue. It's all about relationships, one-on-one -on -one conversations. And number, you could keep going. Number three, uh, we did have a strategic plan. We made sure we looked at our strengths, our weaknesses, our objectives, and we, you know, you don't leave things to uh, chance. You plot out where we're going to achieve our goals. Uh, next, and no silos, right? Everything had to be interconnected, which is really exciting. And our political department is connected to uh, everything else. And then we built, built the structure, engagement, and leadership development. And that's uh, the CAT teams, uh, that's our contract action teams, our chapter action teams, cluster leaders for every group of um, schools. Now, UTLA, we're about 34,000 members. We're uh, early ed to adult ed and K through 12. And we also have a lot of out of classroom, like counselors, uh, nurses, psychiatric social workers, and so forth, like 60 job categories. So we're quite diverse, including substitutes. So we're a big union. So we had to do everything right. and we in order to make sure that we had unity and collective action and broad and deep support across the base. So um, we built that structure and Reclaim Our Schools LA. This is key. We came to our community and said, our community organizations that were, we've been aligned with so, so somewhat, and we said, we have not been a good community partner in the past. We know that we have used you when we needed you, and we haven't listened. 
So we wanted to start a new relationship and we asked them to give us a chance. And they did, or at least some of them did. Uh, we, we weeded out the ones that were funded by corporate charter schools that we couldn't really work with, but uh, we brought together, like um, Ashley said, Reclaim Our Schools LA is our anchor. And from there we built out, but um, they had to, they, we had to build that relationship of trust. We had to listen. And then from that, they told us what they wanted in the contract in our, before our strike in 2017, and we delivered that. Uh, and we made sure that what our student voice, they wanted to end the wanding in, of the racially profiled uh, criminalization, and we made sure that even though we couldn't keep that in the package, we had to pull it out because we were told that if there was a strike, it would be illegal. Uh, because it was outside the scope of bargaining. But at the last hour, when the dis school district was desperate to end the strike, that's when we said, you have to agree to this. Mm -hmm. You have to agree to community schools. You have to agree to the charter ending charter school moratorium. And they signed everything because they wanted to end the strike. We were at our peak of leverage. Our peak of leverage because we had 70,000 people down in the street. So that's how you, we were able to win and leverage uh, what, what our community wanted. And because of that, we're so much farther along now. And all these demands that you could see is built, we built from that. Our community, our students have been visiting school board members, pushing climate justice demands, pushing racial justice issues. And we got our Black Student Achievement Program, which is um, our way of supporting the historically underfunded, uh, discriminatory uh, you know, schools that we've had over the years, and to really invest, invest in supports with counselors and um, you know, uh, restorative justice programs, curriculum, curriculum that's sensitive to our students. That's how we invest in our schools. So that's key is that, you know, again, you have to listen and you have to give, give our partners the freedom to bring to us what they need so we can push it at the bargaining table. So we'll keep on going. I'll try to keep this, <laughs> keep it. Uh, this is, this is a structures and tactics. Uh, again, those four um, key organizations, and we're generating demands through community engagement. We're building partnerships with other progressive organizations, and I know that they're going to talk a little bit more about that right after I finish this, uh, this part with UTLA. So um, we used escalating actions. Uh, that's how you build support, right? You got to know that you're going to win it. Be before you have that rally, you, you, you don't want to have a poor turnout, right? You got to know you're there and your members are there. So we had uh, petitions, we had databases, we were ready for every activity and we had escalating action. The next slide shows you that chart that uh, more risk that was involved. You know, first you wear a red shirt on Tuesdays, uh, then you go all the way to the strike, but it was taking step by step. This took five years, you guys. It was not overnight. We built and built, and it takes time, but when you build solidly, it, you can keep moving forward. Um, next slide. Go on offense, control the narrative. Uh, we said, do you want a fighting union? And our members went, came with us. Uh, we're going to take a strong stand on social justice. We are going to go in front of the art museum. Eli Broad said he wanted to take out 50% of our schools and charterize them. That was the environment in 2014 that we we're faced with. Charterization, which was destroying public schools and an existential threat, that's the environment. Social justice was in the environment where the we were defunded every single year because of Prop 13 in the state of California, which was a property tax initiative that defunded our schools. We went from number three to number close to the bottom of 50 in, this, in the nation in terms of our funding. That was the environment. And we increased our numbers of students of color to 80%, 90% of our school districts are students of color, 80% in poverty. So the demographics shifted as the funding shifted. That was the environment in our place-based LA 
in 2014. And then we also have climate change, as you know, which got, just gets worse, right? And we have dilapidated buildings that are built over 100 years ago, not keeping up for the infrastructure. So that's the place. And then the last one is we connected with our state and local affiliates as well as all of our communities. We're building a movement and we are all interconnected. Thank you. I'll let you pass it to me. Thank you, all of that was the most best information. Um, I hope everyone's taking good notes, right? Um, and so Ashley, being on the community side, right? And oftentimes for folks who don't know, Los Angeles schools aren't really touted as the best schools all the time. And there's constantly, there had been this long push for charterization all over the place, right? Often, oh, well, if you want to send your kid to a good school, then send them to a charter school because you got to pull them out of this system, right? Can you talk about how it is being in an organization and informing parents and coming with research and providing them that information and organizing them to know the truth um, and how that went? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the number one thing is they know way more than me. Like they know the answers already. It really is just about that agitation uh, to pull it out. And like sometimes I think that's like the hardest part. I think myself, I'll be vulnerable and honest here in saying that like not being a parent myself, I feel like I struggle sometimes to like really like relate to folks because I have no idea what they're going through. I mean, I take care of my mom, but that's a little bit different. It's not like I'm like raising a, you know, a baby to an adult. So like, I know that's like that a lot of pressure, but that's exactly that. I think coming in with just genuine love for this movement and um, listening to people, that's really key. And that's really like how I got started. Like as an intern, I would just be calling people during COVID and literally just asking them like how they're doing. And you had no idea like how powerful like that would be to somebody that was like really struggling during the pandemic. There was so much hardship that was experienced amongst our communities of color here in Los Angeles. Uh, because as Arlene mentioned, like our district is a very high need district. The middle class parents, a lot of the um, white parents, they aren't sending their kids to public schools. They can pay for private schools. And so, uh, and then this systematic defunding of public education since the 70s um, has really like, you know, choked like, you know, what, what's available at schools. And so uh, just asking those questions about like, do you think this is right? Like, how does it make you feel that the district has more money than they've ever had and your kid doesn't even have cool, cool water at their school? Like, they would, like, you know, push the water fountain and it would just trickle out, like, warm water. It's like, how does that make you feel? And then that would be, like, really, like, the secret sauce to be, like, ah, I'm mad. Like, <laughs> and that's, you know, people, they get activated when they get angry and then they see that it's part of a larger structure. Um, that, you know, th that these privates, uh, privatization isn't the answer, this charterification isn't the answer um, because, you know, charter schools are, they're run like a business. They don't really, uh, they're not accountable in the same way that our traditional public schools are. Their, their workforce uh, isn't organized by and large. And so it's just so many things that like once you like start to peel the layers of the onion, it just clicks and, and we find people like Ali. <laughs> What an excellent segue. Ali, can you share with us what it's like to be a parent, um, what it's like to make the step into getting organized, and like, did you approach teachers? Did teachers approach you? How did that work out for you? Well, I think that um, kind of a very formative experience was being a parent and participating in the 2019 strike and just seeing the power of the entire city coming together to demand better working conditions, better classroom experiences for children, um, incorporating things that you wouldn't normally think would be included in a contract, such as racial and social justice demands. Um, and I think that kind of have, has laid the foundation ever since for people to really think about, as Arlene was saying, that learning conditions are working conditions and that the outside of a schoolyard where kids spend a fair amount of their day for recess, PE, and after school needs to be a better place. And if there's a healthy environment at the school, the kids are gonna be healthier. Um, 
If you look at many of the areas in Los Angeles that have been redlined, which was a systematic grading of whether or not people, the perceived ability of people to pay back loans, such as mortgages, um, those areas are typically communities of color and there was much like deterred investment in open space, parks, uh, trees, and you look at heat maps of Los Angeles and it completely lines up with where communities were redlined and how high the temperatures are because there's just such a higher presence of asphalt. You have often polluting industries and you don't have that many trees to offset the heat and to clean the air. And so then you look at these schools that are often the hottest location in every single neighborhood are schools because they have so much asphalt. And then if a school is heating up a neighborhood, neighborhoods are heating up a city, collectively we're just exacerbating this giant problem. And as we experience the most extreme heat wave these last couple of weeks, um, air conditioners were breaking, kids were just sitting during recess and PE. It was devastating to see that across the city and we're just completely unprepared. And we need to consider our outdoor environment is just as important as our indoor environment. Thank you. Arlene, can you explain how uh, the new approach of bargaining for the common good developed um, around Los Angeles-based injustice? Um. Yes. Um, bargaining for the common good, again, is a part of social justice, right? It's, it's like a duh, of course. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, one thing about LA that I want to mention, too, is we say we're a union town. And we're part of the LA County Federation of Labor, which is 300 uh, local unions. So our strike was also not only parent community support, but heavily labor support. Uh, as, we, as I shared last night, the fire trucks coming down to support us in the morning. Uh, but many labor unions uh, get, you know, had their facilities open to us and supported us. So it is uh, social justice totally uh, embraced by the city of Los Angeles. And I feel like um, what, what really has struck me is that, you know, we have conservative members. Uh, we have the Valley, which kind of historically is considered white, but it has changed. It's, it's like majority uh, Latinx as well. But what, what has been really interesting is that as you fight for social justice, as you put that on the forefront, uh, we, ha I, we really haven't had much resistance from our members, but you lead. You have to be uncomfortable always in pushing and leading and, and putting, act, putting out uh, a progressive agenda, being a militant union. And of course, we, we have to work through differences, and, um, you know, but quite frankly, it hasn't been as hard as I thought it would be to bring folks along to, to show you know, the model of how we need to fight for everyone. For example, I'm gonna give one example. One of the issues that we've struggled with recently is uh, over-policing. Um, our students have made it very clear that a priority for them is to get rid of the police on our schools. We have a police force that's one of the largest in the nation at our school site, and it's $77 million that have gone into the police. So what our students did, and students deserve, led by our students and community organizations, is they visited the school board, they spoke out at school board meetings, they held press conferences, they took it on, and they actually got the school board to take out $22 million from that 77 and form the Black Student Achievement Program. They're the ones who did that. And this Black Student Achievement Program is about equity. It's about humanizing, seeing the humanity in every student and giving them the resources they need to be successful. It's not like the usual approach of school districts to just throw money to high priority schools, right? And which is a deficit model. This is transformative. Our contract is transformative in social justice. And what that did is it enabled us to put that Black Student Achievement Program into our contract. Write a new article 
and put it into the contract along with, I got to tell you, community schools. That is our model to stop the privatization, invest in our neighborhood schools, and also it's a social justice model. It's about collaboration with parents' community. It's about a culturally responsive curriculum. It's about student supports uh, during school and after school. It's about having a community school coordinator who uh, is able to oversee all of that, who's a union member. And all of this is about how we transform our schools in, in deep ways. So we've taken it further uh, in relation to all the dimensions that we have been fighting, social justice, parent community collaboration. And we brought um, Reclaim Our Schools to share with us what they wanted our contract to look like this time. And that's all the demand you see here. They brought it to us. They did the research. They knew they had the parent forums and so forth. They, I'll let them share that. But it's because they brought it to us. We pushed it at the table. We brought them to the table. And we expanded our bargaining team from 15 tight core members that bargained that strike to we're about at 85 now. We keep growing because we're, we're opening it up. It's connected to our s infrastructure of our schools. So our schools represent our bargaining team members. Bargaining, like I said last night, bargaining is a scorecard that tells us how good we're doing in the, in the game of organizing. Because anything we win at the table is because of what we have out on the, on the streets. And people fighting, right? So we put together a package that's based on social justice, climate justice, uh, and a wide array. It's like four or five times more than our, our strike demands in terms of community, what our community wants. They brought it to us. They presented it. And even though the districts rejected it, we're going to fight to win it. Okay, now I'm going to ask Ashley and Allie jointly um, if you could share about, um, as a community coalition and as parents, right, how do you, what are the current climate justice and environmental justice demands? How are they decided upon, right, and what's next? Sure, so I can get this started and then I'll pass it to Ali. Um, but Arlene shared a little bit about bringing our people directly to the table, even before that in the development of this really extensive platform. Um, it really was like having several different community listening sessions where we would just open up the room and be like, all right, y'all, like, what do you want to see in your schools? And um, the things that hundreds of parents and students and community members came up with uh, were they weren't like directly like verbatim like oh I want to see climate justice in my schools but it was like ideas like oh I want to see community gardens at my school uh, I want to see more green space because my kids playground is completely blacktop um, it was things like ethnic studies like I want like students would be like I want to learn in my classes like you know people history from people that look like me. Um, I know that's something that I really resonate with because I'm not from LA, I'm from the Central Valley and like we never learned about the farm workers movement and like I'm like yeah like you all should be like learning about like the native peoples that lived in Los Angeles before then that really offers a vision for how um, we could you know manage our, our, our climate and stuff and really honing in on that. So it was like ideas that like that that we would form into policy um, and also incorporate more things that would make it like environmental justice on a more holistic way. So as you can see from uh, one of the handouts that's specifically about the healthy green public schools, it's stuff like uh, more green spaces, um, it's stuff like stormwater capture because asphalt just leads to flash flooding. Like there's no way for the water to go except like to flood our drains. Um, it's, it's stuff like climate literacy, which is, it sort of incorporates that element of ethnic studies, but like how do we learn about climate in places outside of just our science classes? And even then it's just like a week or so of like instruction that we learn in our science classes. Like how do we like 
read books that are about climate justice or how do we uh, read like essays that tell us like where our water is coming from like all of those things could be incorporated into our K through 12 and students want to learn about it like I'm the resident member of Gen Z here and like I know that I get a lot of my information off of like TikTok because I'm not learning it anywhere else like I want to know about like what's happening with our climate and what we can do about it um, and students do too and like I feel like that's really powerful because uh, it's so easy to be caught up in like climate doom and like feeling like what what you know that we're inheriting a world that uh, is too far gone and like that's really not the case like there's so much we could be doing uh, so I'll pass the mic now to Allie. <laughs> I think also building off of what Ashley is saying is like is is getting access to this knowledge and context that's so often missing in our conversations about well climate change isn't just like an accident like it's been like a systemic and systematic um, oppression of people oppression of land and how this all together all ties together to see where we are right now and it's in the classroom we need to be learning this but it also needs to be outside we cannot understand the problems and the challenges that we face without understanding our local environment and how it works. We need to understand how water works. We need to understand how pollinators and birds work and how they connect with healthy soil and how all of that leads to functioning ecosystems to clean our air and clean our water because healthy ecosystems regulate our weather patterns. And this is something that we're completely divorced from because if you look at our built environment, all you have to do is look out this window and see what we prioritize. Um, you know, the built environment is a reflection of our values. So if a kid going to school with complete asphalt every day and they live in an area that is entirely covered in asphalt, it is no fault of theirs that they have no idea how this works or even care that this is something to protect, right? So their physical daily experience needs to have this nature that they get to experience as an outdoor classroom that they get to learn about, but also that's extraordinarily healing. If you look at like trauma-informed uh, approaches to education and teaching, nature is such a huge part of that. And for that to be something that helps them come to school and feel more calm instead of being in an environment that aggravates everything else that's going on in their daily life. Um, so much of the environmental movement has been about, well, I need to protect this pristine nature out there, right? But if we kind of switch that on its head and see the problems that are in our backyard, the factories, the just, you know, the decimation of nature around us, we have to think about climate change as a local solution. It's in our, we have to start with our neighborhoods. We have to start looking at our neighborhoods differently. And when you add up neighborhoods, that leads to global solutions. But we think so much of our solutions are out there with big billions of dollars, but it's really, how do we heal our local neighborhoods? Thank you. So I think an, an overwhelming theme has been here, obviously, that this was a coalition, right? The strike was a win um, across the board, but it required a group of folks in different spaces to come together. Um, and for many of us in other unions with our own fights and our own struggles and our own goals and things we want on the bargaining table, right? Um, Ali, can you talk about specifically how did UTLA and the teachers and the community organizations really like honor and respect what it is that you were looking for and how did they specifically support what your demands were? Well, I think it's kind of that common theme that we're all talking about, that your learning conditions are the working conditions and that the climate crisis is only escalating and that, I mean, kids get really sick from being hot and so do their parents and so do the teachers. It's not like we can't see this as separate anymore. It's all interconnected. All right, so now I think we're going to see if we have any questions from the audience. Okay, we're going to start here. Um, 
I have so many, but I'll ask one first. Um, I'm Cliff from Minnesota, from Unite here, uh, the Hotel Union, 2017. Um, how did you, I'm assuming you saw the, the like consciousness of the rank and file teachers and families change over the course of the strike uh, and transform. And I'm basically curious, uh, what did that look like? What were the patterns of that kind of transformation of consciousness? Sure, that's a great question. Um, Everybody heard it, right? You can all hear. Yeah. So how did it change? Um, I was just thinking, as you, before you were talking as well, about the political education that, we were, we, that we've done throughout. Um, and like we're doing political education right now that for our members to understand is we need all of this. You know, we have a lot of members who only care about their salary or only care about whether they're a music teacher about that or early educator, a lot of silos, right? And the most important thing is for us to be one union and to fight together. And that's what we keep stressing, is that we need everyone to support all of this. And we are fighting for all of our members and our students and families. And it's, it's not about your individual interests. And I think that's where we get issues, right, when people think only about themselves, and then the, the district's able to divide and conquer. So uh, we've been fighting hard to build the collective spirit, and that's a lot of conversations, and trying to get people to see, you know, what their issue is connected, is, it, what their issue is and how it's connected to the bigger picture and how other people are affected. And just hearing that, you know, helps people move hearing that, oh yeah, my child is experiencing this, and, um, or, or even like, for example, some of our itinerants who, you know, who travel, sharing some of their conditions. People never thought of that, right? You, you don't have a room to work in or whatever. So uh, doing that, and then during the strike, you saw in the movie that, yeah, sometimes people didn't want to vote for it or, or didn't agree, we had to really intentionally work on FUD. Do you guys know what FUD is? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's what we would label that, yes, you know, they would say they're afraid. We get that you're afraid. That's what the district wants you to be afraid. But look at this. What's the alternative? You know, and, and just talk them through their fears. Uh, the district said, they came out with these crazy things, like they said special education teachers couldn't strike because they're needed in the classroom. And, and, and you know, our special education teachers said, yeah, they never cared for us before, and now <laughs> we think they, you, you know, they're not caring for you now. We just point those things out, right? And show them what the district is doing. So addressing the fear, the uncertainty. I can't. I can't go on strike. I'm a single mom. I won't have the. the you heard that in the film. But really working through it with them. That's exactly what the district wants you to do. You know, and the importance of staying together and the doubts. Just tackling them head on and working through one on one conversations and building relationships. Uh, you can get through it. Thank you. Uh, yes, in the back. I was just wondering, so I'm, oh, sorry, I'm Angie. Uh, I'm a uh, Gladstone Arts McGinnis with the Lee Inside Law Firm, but I used to be a Lee and South member, and when I was uh, working for a local, the local won like, a really great contract that most people were happy with, but some of the most like dedicated, um, people who've been like out, you know, ready to go on strike, like leading, um, like people like leading the picket teams, um, were some like some of the people who felt like they were left out of the best parts of the contract. So I was wondering if you had that experience with like amazing contracts and the people who felt like they were they didn't get what they wanted, who were also like the people who were like out there in the rain all that time, like whether they were parents or members or um, like the students or community members. Um, and I was wondering if you like if you could talk about how you talked to them after and if any like how you brought them back into this contract fight or if um, there were like any last week or difficulties with that. Yeah, I, c I could start with that question. Um, great question, by the way, and it's something we constantly deal with. Uh, and as great as that strike was, and as comprehensive as all of our wins are, uh, we did have members saying, I got nothing from the strike. 
Uh, and and I'm thinking, uh, did you get a raise? <laughs> for, for one, everybody got a raise, right? So uh, it's kind of crazy. But I'll give you an example of a, of a group that we're still struggling with. It's our OTPT, Occupational Therapists and Physical Therapists. They, for some reason, we have about 200 of them in, in LA Unified. But for some reason, they keep with that message. You haven't done any, you know, we got nothing from the strike. You don't care about us. All you care about is teachers, right? So, uh, by the way, I'm a speech therapist, and um, they, look, at these are all the changes we've made. We increased our staffing by twice, and we increased our number of chapter leaders in, in the OTPT and these small groups. Uh, we gave, we we made them have more than one chapter chair of a whole group. Now they could have it by geographical areas. So we built the infrastructure to have more leaders within the teams. And most of our other teams are growing and prospering and uh, really building strong cat teams, right? Strong leadership. But for some reason, the OTPT just haven't taken off on that. So um, we have to have more meetings with them and explain that to them what we have done to try to build them up and lift them up. But I can't tell you that it's always successful because we still have people saying, you haven't, you know, you left us out. Um, and they, and I'm asking them, well, what did you want? And sometimes it's something that we never heard about because they never told us, right? And so we say, and we come to them and say, what do you want to see in the contract? I went to every single little group. What do you want to see in the contract? And then we try to incorporate it, but we can't put ever we couldn't put everything in. And some things conflict with each other, right? One group wants this, the other group wants that. We just try to educate. Educate them about the process, educate them about what we're doing, and try to bring unity and solidarity. But it doesn't, it's not easy. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go back here. Fresher. Uh, Andrew, Seattle Education Association. Uh, thank you all so much for presenting. Very inspiring. We're in a place in our union trying to get to a similar place. I was curious with the demands for climate upgrades, if there's like coalition work with the building trades and like saying it'll be, um, making sure that they're doing that work and getting those jobs and like if they've been like coming along and working closely in solidarity in that fight. Yeah, love this question. Also, solidarity to you. Um, I know y'all are getting down up there in Seattle, um, so that's awesome. Um, yeah, so I didn't get to mention it during the panel, but um, Lane especially, my or anchor organization, are channeling a lot of effort into uh, the climate justice space, and so we have a climate justice working group. Uh, and so we make decisions and like organize alongside um, other organizations that have been doing this work for a long time now because we recognize that uh, people have been trying to accomplish climate justice in LA for a long time. <laughs> and so they're going to have a lot more insights, a lot more answers. Um, they provide great uh, steering. Um, and so for the building trades, um, those connections are still pretty uh, initial. Um, I know that uh, I see DSA in the room. Shout out to y'all. Um, they have kind of been like starting to facilitate that we haven't had a formal meeting with them yet but especially this was like any uh, like one of our first like forays um, into that uh, but yeah so we're not quite there yet but we're working towards it um, we're getting those endorsements in um, and uh, yeah thank and you jobs to move oh yeah yes yes ahead. yes yes and then uh, jobs to move America is also a really great uh, um, organization that has been in our working group too. They work with uh, the building trades in the uh, electric vehicle coalition. Um, so yes, they uh, kind of like indirectly, but still within it with, yeah, Jobs Move America is awesome. Thank you. Up front, yes. Yeah, it seems like an 80% bargaining team is kind of unusual. How do you structure that to be effective? Wow, I love this question about our bargaining team. Um, so, you know, like we, like I said, in the strike we had 15, you know, bargaining team members, which is, which is pretty, you know, good size. Um, and um, I was really kind of nervous about it, 
but I knew it was the right thing to do. We have to keep making sure that we build member involvement, engagement, and leadership, right? So we decided that we don't have like open bargaining where anybody could come in. We connected our bargaining to our structure and that's the right way to do it. Because like in the past, we used to have like an organizing committee here or a parent community committee there. It didn't work. It didn't work because it wasn't a part of the structure and it didn't build off of each other. It was like outside. So this time with a bargaining team that's so large, and let me tell you, I was very nervous about some of the people on our bargaining team. I would not choose them to be on the bargaining team. <laughs> uh, but when you set the norms, you, the, the only thing we asked of them, they had to be elected, so they're connected with the school sites, and they had to sign an agreement. And that agreement said that they would be a part of this team if they missed a session, we're gonna keep going on, right? And they're bargaining for the whole, and you know, kind of the respect kind of thing, all, all of that. But um, we're gonna try to do things by consensus. And so uh, it's been very, like, you know, building the plane and flying it, trying to figure out what to do at each step. But it's been amazing to me because when you built the environment, uh, there has been, uh, the, the problematic folks have kind of stepped back. Cause, or they would speak a lot at the beginning and nobody would really listen to them. So they've kind of been, you know, naturally put aside. And uh, it's been, f the pro tr I keep saying, trust the process and the people. And our members, trust our members. And we on the... the the quote experienced ones on our bargaining team, we approached it as we need to learn just as much as they're learning. We're in this together and maybe we, you know, like for example at our first session, they were so angry that the, that the school board didn't have a response. They expected the school board at the next meeting to have a response to our proposals and we're thinking, oh my God, you know, that they don't understand this is not this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, right? And we're thinking, should we tell them that? And we thought, you know, maybe we shouldn't. Let's let them just say what they feel. Let's let this move. And we realize maybe we're wrong. Maybe we've, are, we're so jaded by how the district's been that we don't expect anything, right? And maybe we should be angrier. We should be, you know, expectant in the way that they are. So, you know, it's a very humbling experience because you, you've got to be, let go of control, you've got to let it work, but trusting in people and working together, and uh, we, we do develop a structure. We had a, our first in-person meeting two days ago, Thursday, uh, because we're at a point in bargaining where we wanted to delve more into each article, get guidance on where there's some flexibility and where there's not, and we wanted to push them to see the whole. And I was so amazed. Nobody was on their phone. Doesn't that tell you something? They were engaged and natural leaders were popping up in every little breakout group. And it's like, wow, I am seeing transformation right before my eyes. And that's how we build a stronger union. And that's how we're moving forward with our, our contract demands. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, Anthony, Local 52, New York, Biopsy. Um, you mentioned yesterday about you increased dues on your members because you asked them to be, you wanted to be more militant. Can you explain more how you did that and how you were able to convince them? Yeah. Okay. This is a biggie because if we didn't do that, we would not have survived the strike nor survived Janice nor be here where we're at. So it, it was huge. Um, I became treasurer of the union in 2012, and by the way, I'm leaving in June because we have term limits, and I am so excited we have a whole new group of new leaders. But anyways, when I came in 2012 as a treasurer, the first thing I found out was that we had a financial cliff. We were bringing in less than we were spending, and our dues was of the lowest of all the unions. It was like 60-something dollars. Um, and we, you know, most of it went to our state and national affiliates, right? So it was like $20 that went to UTLA. 
Um, so we needed to, uh, I saw that we needed to do something about that. They tried years before and they like had 23% yes for a dues change. And they, I hated the way they advertised it. it was like for a cup of coffee a day, invest in your union, right? Like what kind of approach is that? So we said, look it. We connected our dues increase with expanding the legal services because we did have a lousy, um, we didn't give enough to our legal supports. And so we had teacher jail issues at that time, exploding numbers of teachers who needed supports. We couldn't offer them the help they needed, so they got angry at the union. So we connected it with legal supports, and then we also merged uh, AFT and NEA uh, together, so we would be members of both, right? Before that, it was one or the other. You were three quarters NEA, one quarter AFT. So we emerged, and then we had legal supports. Those were the main things that we, uh, we said. We were going to be stronger. We were going to be a fighting union, and we're going to fight privatization. Do you want a strong union? So when we put it that way, our members responded, and we had charts up, we showed the bad actors, we showed how Eli Broad was trying to privatize our schools. We had little uh, PowerPoint that showed smoke, you know, fires, and you know, all the dangers that we were facing. We showed the chart that we were at the bottom compared to all the other unions. You know, we educated, educated, educated. It took years. I mean, I did that from 2012. So we got the dues change in 2015 when the new transformative leadership team came in. We said, okay, first thing we got to do is get a raise because we hadn't had one in eight years. We got that. We got trust. Second thing is get the dues change. So we got the dues campaign. We called it Build the Future, Fund the Fight. It was a whole union-wide campaign. Everything, research, parent community, everything was focused on winning Build the Future, Fund the Fight. So when we had the vote, 82% of our members voted to increase their own dues by 30% a 30% increase. And then we were prepared for Janus because then we you know, were able to have the money that we needed. Oh, and another thing I forgot. We had this part of our, our union dues. We, you know, be, when the, the state and national kept increasing, we had to pay that increase to them, but our dues stayed the same. So now if the state and national increase, then the members pay that. Uh, so, which every, every other union does, but we didn't do that. That's why our money was shrinking every year. So, we're, we got brought up to speed. And so, with that dues increase, we were able to invest in our strike. We had plenty of money to do all the organizing that we needed because it takes money, right, to, to invest into a strike. And we have a strike fund. So, because of that, we built a strong fight. And that's how we were able to, I think, really grow. It, you do have to have the, the supports, the infrastructure, and the money to do that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, in the back. Yes, in the blue. Hi, uh, Danielle. She, Danielle, she heard uh, Union Base New York. Uh, I was going to ask yesterday, you mentioned uh, that you got in like uh, solidarity from uh, firemen come to the um, strike. Uh, so I was going to ask, like, have you been able to get a lot of UTLA members to go and like show solidarity with other labor efforts across LA, and like, have there been challenges with doing things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I was sharing, we went to the County Federation of Labor, and they endorsed, you know, our strike before, and then we we got a lot of support. But that's what we do. People, we come together at at the labor union, the county fed labor union, and people share what their struggles are, or what their fights, or what their strike, or whatever it is. So we go to the grocery store and support that picket line, or we do the different actions uh, to support. You might, you want to add that? You're shaking your head, Ashley. Yeah, definitely. Um, since I've been part of it, we've. Uh, been at the picket line for Unite Here Local 11, um, yeah. UFCW, the Food and Commercial Workers. Um, 
Yeah, those are the first two that come to mind. Yes, definitely, yeah. we, we have to do that. And I know it's a strain because everybody right now uh, is, is really struggling. I mean, we found out, we did a survey of our members, and 66% can't live in the neighborhood that we work in. 27% uh, of our members have a second job. And 70% of our members said they are thinking about or going to leave teaching <laughs> that they love. I mean, we've had experienced teachers saying they're leaving because they just cannot manage. Uh, it's a desperate situation. Everybody's stressed on time. So it is hard. It is hard. Um, but we do what we can. And we do have like priorities so we know what we can do and what we can't do. Thank you. Yes, up front. Um, my name is Matt. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Matthew. Um, are you making progressives um, in West Virginia? Um, I'm working on a Board of Education campaign back home. And if he's elected, he'll be the first person of color ever to serve on our Board of Education. Wow. Where is that again? Uh, it's in Cowboy County, West Virginia. I'm from Huntington. Um, West Virginia? Yes. Um, <laughs> wow. So our teacher's contract also, are there in negotiation again this year? Um, is there any tips from any of you all that for me, running this campaign that like we should look out for, that we should demand the office and hold them accountable. Okay, great, great question. Uh, political campaigns, uh, West Virginia, so many allies there in the in the teachers union. Um, what we've we have really um, transformed our political involvement work as well. Uh, in the past, we were so frustrated because we would get somebody in. And then, and then they would turn on us, right? And they would vote the opposite, and they're not held accountable. So um, I think what one of the first things we did is, we, you know, we developed a questionnaire, and we interview, and we make sure that, uh, you know, are they getting any charter school money, or and so forth. And so we we make it harder. You know, we have a process that they have to get endorsed by us. And now our, our name means something, which really helps, because in the past it, it didn't mean very much. But now to get endorsed by UTLA carries weight, because public opinion shows that we, our union is right up there. You know, in the past it was like teachers, they like their classroom teachers, but you don't like the union, right? But that has changed from the strike. So, yeah, it means something. So we're able to... Um, select candidates and we know them like for right now we have a school board race going on and we have a candidate two candidates that we've endorsed and one of them we're putting almost we're really putting a, all of our strength into that and that her name is Rocia Rivas uh, and she was actually in the movie last night one of the parents who's now running for school board so we know she's been with us right from the beginning and so there's knowing the candidates as well as, as giving them a process to work through. And then afterwards, our community takes over. They visit them. They make sure they do the right thing. You have to be after them. Um, and it's great having elected school board. You know, like I said last night, Chicago, New York, they do not have, ele they have appointed uh, superintendents and, and you know, the mayor, mayoral appointees. But with an elected school board, it is critical, uh, and it really makes a difference. So putting investment into transforming our school boards is really important. Getting people of color who, who believe in what the community believes in, you know, is really what we need to do across America. And right now with the uh, CRT, you know, and uh, lack of, teaching, freedom and teaching, we have a crisis going on and we need to fight hard to make sure teachers can teach. Uh, we've got great things in our contract, but uh, when you have that movement going on behind, um, there creates a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt. Yeah, and I would build from that and say like really building solidarity with community and parents and students too. Students have a lot of power. Um, they live through school every day and have a different perspective than the teachers. Um, we've seen the power of student organizing here in Los Angeles and in other cities as well. Um, but yeah, so I would say like definitely um, uniting those two struggles because I feel like the common narrative is that we want to put parents and teachers at odds and there's like this like power dynamic and stuff and like a lot of our struggles are very intertwined 
Um, a lot of teachers are parents too. That's right. Um, and a lot, like Arlene was saying, like people can't afford to live in in the neighborhood that they teach in. So really like uniting those struggles, um, the way that we've uh, rolled out our structure within Reclaim Our Schools LA is based on school board district. So the way that like cities are kind of divided into like city council districts, the school board is two and so it's seven, seven different areas. And so we have one organizer uh, assigned, one or, yeah, one organizer assigned to each of the seven school board districts and really keeps up with them. Um, so that there's like continuity, there's relationships that are built. And then we all come together, which I think is really exciting for people because uh, they might not have any contact. Like someone from the Valley might never see anybody that lives like in uh, Wilmington, which is like really far south. And so it's cool. Like they see that like there's like, oh, you care about this too. Like, and we're gonna go to this school board meeting together and, and, and raise some hell. So like, it's like, it's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so that is going to conclude our panel at this moment. But um, I invite everyone who probably has many questions throughout the day. I think folks are going to be around today. Sure. Yeah. Um, so definitely grab some contact information. Grab some contact information uh, so you can reach out to folks and take this knowledge with you. Can I yeah. just say yes, one Yes, of last? course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll, we'll maybe we'll go real yes. quickly down. Yeah, I just wanted to share that. You know, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. I have three generations of my family who've gone to LA Unified. And um, all of my family was incarcerated during World War II before I was born. So I know there's a sense of real uh, social justice in, in, in me uh, and also the trauma uh, that, that my family experienced. But I think you know, the commitment and the dedication uh, that I, I feel and, and many, many others uh, feel to really fight for social justice, to really make sure our students are represented, their voices are heard because they traditionally have not been heard. And, you know, the, to transform our public schools because public schools the, are the essence of our demo democratic country so far, so-called democratic country, but we've got to fight hard to not let it be privatized like they're doing everything else. There's a postal worker here um, that they're trying to privatize that as well. So we really feel that this is a, a fight worth having and giving all of ourselves to it. So we're so glad we could join you in this. And I just want to make a plug for the staying involved. Like, especially if you're local, we'd love to see you when we have actions. We have them a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there's a QR code there for our individual pledge. Um, if your organization wants to endorse our Beyond Recovery platform, I highly encourage you to do so, especially if you're local. Um, we accept them from anywhere, though. But I mean, especially if you're local. And then I have my email up there. Y'all are definitely welcome to reach out. I love having coffee chats with labor people. So that's my plug. You want to plug uh, Angelina's for Green Schools? Yes. Uh, sure. Plug. So we have a website, Angelina's for Green Schools .com, and it really talks about what is school greening, all the best practices, standards. It has the how not to green, all the things you don't want to have on a school campus. We also, if you're local, there's local case studies of schools that have been green. We also include uh, national examples of school districts that have approached this district-wide, which is what we're really pushing for, is for this to be a comprehensive district-wide greening. Um, so many large school districts have done it, so we know that it's possible. Um, and for people who are parents in the audience, just uh, as you were talking about, you know, getting to know your school board, getting to understand kind of how school infrastructure does work because it makes a difference. We don't realize how much the school board actually listens when parents start to speak up because they're like, oh, yeah. they're listening and they're tracking what we're doing. And so when you start tracking what they're doing, it, they start changing what they are doing. And so it really does make a difference. Thank you. Thank you.